Steve, let's talk about how the Monrovia Historical Society came to exist. Fine. It really begins with Myron Hotchkiss. Myron was a longtime employee of Southern California Edison. He reached retirement age in 1967, retired from Edison, and needed something to do. Myron became involved with the Friends of the Monrovia Public Library, and served as a member, I believe, of the board, but at least he was active. And Myron became the chair of the Historical Committee, which was interesting because the Historical Committee consisted of one member, Myron. In July of 1974, George H. Anderson passed away at the age of nearly 88. George had lived almost his entire life in the house his father had built in 1886 on East Lyme. But for whatever reason, George's mother had returned to her native Ohio during her pregnancy with George, so that even though George lived in Monrovia or lived in California for 87 plus years, he was not a native son. That ruled out his membership in the native sons of the Golden West. And George was, was known to comment on that occasionally. The California Community Foundation was the beneficiary of George's estate. He knew about the foundation because he had retired from what was then Security First National Bank of Los Angeles, who was the trustee for the California Community Foundation founded in 1915 by Joseph F. Sartori, who was the, then the president of the Security Trust and Savings Bank. George had an older brother, Louis, who predeceased him so George had no near relatives to leave his estate, and so he decided, knowing of the foundation, to leave his entire estate, including the house, the Anderson House, to the foundation. About that same time, we began to celebrate the American Bicentennial, the 200th anniversary of the signing of the Declaration of Independence in 1776. There were a group of local individuals, historically minded, including Myron, who wanted to have a specific bicentennial project to focus on. And the idea was suggested that the committee obtain an early Monrovia house, restore it, and furnish it so that future generations of Monrovians could immerse themselves in what it would have been like to live in the Monrovia of the 1880s and 1890s. The chair of that project was Bryce Tullis. And finally they decided that the Anderson House would be that the type of house that would lend itself to their concept of an historical home. There's some debate whether the house was given outright or whether a grant was made by the California Community Foundation to purchase the Anderson House. I should mention that the house was not a saleable property. It was, it suffered from more than, George just didn't believe in doing much about his house. Uh, I remember the front yard as being primarily sand with a sago palm or two. The house appeared to have not been painted in, well, a conservative estimate would be 40 years. And it just, it needed a lot of tender loving care and George had not spent much on the house except for lived there until his death in 1974 and only lived in a few rooms of the house. For example, when they were clearing out the house, they picked up the carpet in the living room or the parlor. And George had followed the same pattern that my grandmother used to follow, which was putting down newspapers over the bare floorboards because they weren't completely sealed and using those newspapers as a barrier between any air that might have seeped up through the cracks in the floorboards and keeping it, keep it in the newspapers rather than permeating the carpet. Well, they pulled up the carpet and here were newspapers underneath dated 1929. So obviously George did not renew those newspapers on a regular basis. So anyway, the grant was made to the Friends of the Library because they were a 501c3 organization that could receive the funds. And then the Friends in turn purchased the house from the California Community Foundation 
and received title to it in July of 1975. And was that a $9,000 grant? Is there Eight or 9,000. I think 9,000 is probably correct. So while I've seen that the house was granted, deeded directly to the friends, I think it was via a grant. So the, the net result was the same, but I think that the foundation probably had to receive some financial benefit from the house for trustee purposes, and so that's how it was handled. So Myron became very much involved in the restoration. I believe he worked on the front porch. I think there are pictures of Myron standing near the porch admiring the tech well I shouldn't say admiring probably estimating the task at hand and maybe later admiring his handiwork in shoring up the porch in the meantime in his capacity in his one-man capacity as chair of the historical committee Myron had been collecting all the Monrovia memorabilia that he could he made it known throughout the community that he was actively seeking out donations of historical material, and so that's how the Historical Society's collection began, with donations to Myron, and then that was augmented by all of Myron's own research. He wrote articles just for the joy of writing about a Monrovia historical topic. He wrote for a little blurb for the Monrovia Today, the community newsletter. Janet Bennett, who's still alive and living in Orange County, cultivated a friendship with Myron and she encouraged him to write on a topic and she would she was the public information officer for the city of Monrovia so the newsletter would feature a Monrovia yesterday and then she would pair that with the Monrovia today so you had the historical perspective and then you had the modern day counterpart and Myron wrote all the Monrovia yesterdays the house was completed about 1970 Five, no, probably a two-year project, let's say about 1978. And it was formally dedicated in September of 1979. And here is the dedicatory brochure from the dedicatory de dedication day, September 16th. It was a nice ceremony. People were invited to attend. There were tours of the house. And then there was a formal dedication on the front porch of the house as Monrovia's heritage home. The idea originally was to not only ref refurbish the house and then furnish it with typical furniture, but also to, to let it serve as a repository. The repository aspect never really matured. It ended up being <clears throat> part of Myron's personal collection. In fact, he kept hinting broadly that it would be really nice if the historical society took ownership and provided a home for it other than Myron's home. And finally, when Myron revised his will, he laughingly said to the Historical Society Board, well, I've willed the contents of my house in the Monrovia Historical Society, and now you'll have to deal with it. So it was a repository, viewed as a repository of what? All historical material. I mean, both, both what Myron collected himself from sources outside the Historical Society, the huge photographic collection that Myron created himself, the articles that Myron wrote about local history, and anything else really that came his way that he thought would be of interest, historical interest in the future. And so where did he get some of these pictures? Some from the Women's Club collection or? Yeah, when the the... yeah, exactly. When the Women's Club disbanded in 1974, Myron, I believe, was given access to the photographs that were on display in the library, which he collected. The Women's Club the Library. The Women's Club Library. When the clubhouse, when, when the club voted to disband and place their clubhouse on the market, I believe Myron was contacted he contacted the club and said, I know you have historical photos in your collection. May I have them to add it to the historical collection? The answer was yes, so Myron gathered those. There were a lot of them having to do with the Bowerman family and the Bartle family because they were prime movers in the creation of the women's club. And then, was it C.T. Renniker? C.T. Renniker, you know, and Sandy, I've never been, I don't know who had C.T. Renniker's collection. He was Monrovia's first historian, 
He died in 1936, shortly after Monrovia celebrated its 50th anniversary. But many of those pictures have inscribed on the back property of C.T. Renniger. So he collected, he was a collector of historical memorabilia as well. Between 1936 and Byron receiving it about 1974 or 75, I do not, do not know in whose custody it was, but it was saved and provided and given to Myron. So we have 1979, the dedication of the Anderson House. And it was about that time that the friends of the library, who still had title to the property, realized that dealing with the Anderson House was beyond the scope of what they needed to do. They were spending a fair amount of their time and probably some of their money on the Anderson House that was viewed as taking away from their primary objective, which was to be a support organization for the Monrovia Library. There was no, at that point, there was no other 501c3 organization in Monrovia who could take title to the Anderson House. So Jan Marug and Kay Coughlin, two longtime Monrovians, put together a mailing list of people they thought would be interested in supporting the formation of an historical society. They contacted them. I was one of them. I still have their letter. It began with the message saying that it was a long time need felt by many Monrovians that as the fourth oldest incorporated city in Los Angeles County, Monrovia should have an historical society, but it did not. So the point in making a contact was to invite people to join in the formation of an historical society. That took place, the Articles of Incorporation were filed with the Secretary of State, and that placed the Historical Society in the position of being able to receive the grant, or the deed, from the Friends of the Monrovia Library, and that deed was executed in November of 1979. So by the beginning of 1980, the Historical Society was up and running with a full board of directors, they had title to the Anderson House, and they had an established membership. The next event was the meeting of the first formative meeting of the Monrovia Old House Preservation Group, because at that time that was the, type, the group's formal name. They existed first as a committee of the Monrovia Historical Society, and then within the first two, possibly three years, as they grew in numbers and in strength, they decided they wanted to become an organization in their own right, so they filed also for 501c3 status and received it. They began having historical tours. I believe the first one was in 1982, and that's a tradition that continued up until this last May when the COVID-19 virus precluded there being a tour. And so their original focus was on, was their audience was people who owned old homes, is or that correct? Were or were interested in old, old homes. homes. And largely homeowners who were hands-on in the restoration. One of the purposes of the group was to acquaint people who were doing that with each other so they could share stories about their own restoration experiences and share, and share resources as far as personnel of companies they had found to assist them in the restoration process. So it was, my primary focus was preservation. It was not a requirement that you have an old house, simply that you were interested in old homes and that you supported historic preservation. Following the establishment of the Monrovia Old House Preservation Group, there was a shift in the membership of the Historical Society. It turned out that those who were younger and had an interest in local history and preservation gravitated to the Old House Preservation Group. The Historical Society was viewed by, quote, the youngsters as more of, a, of an old folks society. I won't say fuddy-duddies, but it was kind of, the, the MOHPG was a younger, more hands-on, more vibrant group and the Historical Society was an older membership who were kind of not that active. They appreciated local history, but they were not so much hands-on. It became increasingly difficult to recruit board members. 
for the Historical Society. And this attrition took place, which it did. Longtime members either passed away or moved out of the area. It was more and more difficult to recruit board members. And so ultimately the Historical Society became dormant from the standpoint of having regular meetings. The bills were paid, the Anderson House was maintained, but that was about it. Not too much took place other than just the very basics to keep the house preserved and to keep the status of the Historical Society active. So not, fewer tours of the Anderson House happened during this time, which fewer is one tours, of the things that happened. Right, because there were, again, there was, there were not docents. Howard Jew, for example, was about the last active docent. He and I would open the house on a regular basis. Kathy Mueller, as she was able, would open the house, but there used to be a long list of docents and gradually they too either passed away, moved out of the area, or reached an age where it was no longer possible for them to perform that function. So I would say for probably 10 years perhaps, not much was going on with the Historical Society other than making sure the Anderson House was maintained. It was, it was painted during that time. Some basic repairs were made, nothing major, but it was kept functional from the standpoint of the basic fabric was preserved. 2015, actually earlier than 2015, was the receipt by the city of Monrovia of the residue of the Bartle Trust. Uh, Doris Spinks Bartle married Gerald F. Bartle, John and Amelia Bartle's son. Gerald died quite young from anemia. He was maybe 48 years of age, leaving his wife Doris with a mentally challenged son, Gerald F. Bartle Jr. Doris took care of her son in her own home as long as she was able, and then she placed him in the Devereaux home in Santa Barbara, actually I think it might be Goleta, which was a home, a group home for mentally challenged or developmentally challenged individuals. She also knew that she wanted to prepare for his care after her death, so she created a trust that would ensure his proper care for his lifetime with the provision that upon his death, the residue of the estate would go to the city of Monrovia for library purposes, which was extremely important extremely appropriate because it was her mother-in-law, um, Amelia Bowerman Bartle, who was instrumental in the founding of the library in the first place. So that was, of course, and Doris served on the library board in her own right during her lifetime. So that was the logical place for those funds to go. At the same time, it became obvious that the Monrovia Historical Collection was underutilized and certainly very difficult of access. The idea was presented that Myron's collection plus all that I'd assembled in my role as city historian, successor to Myron, be digitized, placed in a database that would allow it to be accessed through the Monrovia Public Library and it became known as the Monrovia Legacy Project and the city of Monrovia very graciously and generous, generously said, we will make the funds in the Bartle Trust available for this purpose because that seems the absolute most appropriate use of those funds. To further the library collections by adding to them the historical records of the Monrovia Historical library, uh, Society. And the society was chosen simply because the vast majority of the historical material was in the possession of the Monrovia Historical Society, not because other organizations didn't have some, but because the majority rested with the Historical Society as the trustee for both Myron's materials, plus what I agreed to have added to it because that was the appropriate use of what I'd collected. So that an ongoing process was established, a database was selected, hours and hours were spent scanning, digitizing the material, generating appropriate labels, checking for historical content, 
and then making sure that all that material was placed in the database so that you could then do a search and find what you were looking for. Uh, on the other end of the camera of the video recording device is one of the prime movers in that, Sandy Burid, who personally downloaded, identified, scanned, etc., to the point of desperation, <laughs> that material. <laughs> but joy along with it. But joy Fascinating and a lot, of, and a lot of fun along the way because a lot of the material probably has, now has far more interest to it than it did. Well, absolutely has far more interest than it did tucked away in a box somewhere. I mean, you could think, oh yeah, that's there. But to have it available for other people to look at and enjoy and respond to is the payoff because now it's enjoyed by the many rather than the few. Or any, anyone who's interested can now indulge themselves wading into the project and looking at all this stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. And I might also add that all of those photographs, over 6,000, are also now archived and protected. So they're in archival sleeves, and so they will no longer be at risk of disintegrating. Right. Okay, so when Byron started, there may have been archival materials available, but they were not generally known, or maybe the long-term benefit of acid-free paper was not known. And of course, in the interim, all kinds of new knowledge about properly storing and archiving material has come to the surface and is now available. So back to the Anderson House. It so, was, question. Yeah. So when it was first, you might just talk about the contents of it, that, that it, what happened to the contents? What wasn't there, right. <laughs> okay. Sadly, in the process of settling George Anderson's estate, the California Community Foundation simply <clears throat> contacted an antique dealer who came in and cleared out the contents of the house, the contents being primarily the furniture. I don't know what kind of personal papers George Anderson might have had. I've never seen a reference to them, but I'm assuming that those were collected and removed from the house at the same time, the furniture. And it was mostly the original furniture from 1886. I doubt that George had added much over the years. So the house was bas basically vacant when restoration began. What the Historical Society was um, the recipient of was three items of original furniture that George had gifted to two sisters, the Moore sisters, uh, Ethel Moore <clears throat> and Irma Bach. They, Ethel Moore's married name, I can't come up with it, she married late in life. Anyway, these two sisters worked with George at the Security Bank in Monrovia. And prior to his death, I think he gave the two chairs that went with the original parlor set to one sister and the settee that went with the parlor, sister, parlor set to the other sister. Anyway, the sisters by this time were quite elderly, probably in their late 80s or early 90s. And through their niece or great niece, they approached the Historical Society and said, we have these items of furniture that were part of the original furnishings of the Anderson House. Would the Historical Society be interested? And of course the response was, yes, we would, since there's nothing left from the original furnishings. So those two, three pieces of furniture were reupholstered in mohair by Ralph Bloomquist, who was the husband of Madeline Bloomquist, a longtime Monrovian, who was active with the Historical Society. He found the material, purchased it, and then very carefully reupholstered so that they appeared then, as they did probably originally, covered in mohair, the same material that was used in 1886 when they were first placed in service. All the other furnishings in the Anderson House presently have mostly been donated and some have been purchased to round out the furnishings. The parlor set is a complete parlor set. The dining room has the settee and the two side chairs from the original part, the original parlor set. Has a sideboard and a dining room table that are from the golden oak period of the 1890s, plus a nice Eastlake bookcase. 
The kitchen has a large cast iron cooking range that was not original to the house, but would be very comparable to what Lizzie Anderson would have used for her baking and cooking. A wood stove. A wood burning kitchen range. It has a wash tub, since of course Lizzie would have washed all the family's clothing in a wash tub on a scrub board, and there is a scrub board there. There is a small ironing board. There is a pie safe, which was an upright cabinet didn't have solid doors. It had doors with screen in them on the front and panels on the side, also screened, called a pie safe because in that era, before window screens were widely used, after you baked a pie or bread or a cake and it needed to cool off, you would place it in the pie safe where flies and other insects could not get close and spoil your baked goods. So it was kept safe from marauding insects. Has a kitchen sink that's about three feet off the ground and you can look at that and say, who would wash dishes at that sink? And the answer was Lizzie Anderson who was probably about five feet tall soaking wet. Has a wonderful flour dispenser. You would buy your flour in bulk, 50 pound bag poured in this large metal canister, and then as you needed it for cooking and for baking, you would simply turn the handle at the bottom, it would sift it into a measuring cup. What else, Sandy? The pump organ. Pump organ in the parlor came from the Howard McQueen, uh, pardon me, McQuig family. Typical of that era, almost every Victorian parlor had a pump organ. Uh, when the youngsters come through to visit, I make it a point of explaining that the Anderson house originally did not have electricity so that all the energy needed to operate these things, like the pump organ, was provided by you who sat and pumped the pedals to generate the suction, the vacuum that caused the pump organ to play. Same thing with the sewing machine in the dining room. You sat down and moved the treadles that moved the sewing machine to do the sewing. No vacuum cleaners, so you ran the carpet sweeper that swept up the dust on the carpet. If you needed to clean the carpet thoroughly, you hauled it outside, threw it over the clothesline, got a rug beater and whacked the rug until all the dust was shaken loose and settled to the ground, and you carried it back in again. So all of these things were donated back and then organized and displayed by the Historical Society, is that correct? Right, and the prime movers in that were Ken and Lukey Schmidt. They took that on as a personal project. They logged in the donations by what the item was, where it was located, and the donor. I believe Lukey coordinated the refinishing of the interior by working with an interior director, decorator to come up with a paint scheme and a flower and a, a wallpaper scheme that would be complementary for that era. For example, the dining room has a pattern, floral pattern that would have been typical. The office has a typical repeating pattern from that era. And there's some thought was given, oh, and then the bath, the bedroom, the middle bedroom has a wallpaper pattern that, imp that uh, employs small repeating pattern of rosebuds. I mean, they, Lukey researched what would have been typical for Victorian interior decor and then made sure that those things were selected and utilized. And then Bryce Tellis coordinated the major he renovation? Co he, he coordinated the, res the uh, resident renovation. He drew up the restoration plan room by room. Either he may have been the primary contact, he solicited volunteers to come in and do the work. For example, local Boy Scout troops worked on scraping the paint from the exterior, the paint that was so dried because it had been exposed for so long, took a major work removing so the house could be repainted. Some of the interior plaster work needed to be repaired or replaced entirely. Some of the men from Second Baptist Church who had plastering skills came and replastered where it was either missing or loose. Other groups like the Garden Club took on exterior landscaping project. As I say, a number of groups were involved in the restoration process. Bryce 
did some projections. For example, he drew up a scale drawing of the original porch railing. It's what's there now as a replacement for the original porch railing, but Bryce took the picture from 1886 or seven and scale drawing to allow that to be replaced at some point. He also did a scale drawing of the cresting, the roof cresting that was on the roof edges originally. He took the picture and did a scale drawing of that. You know, those things never happened, but Bryce had the forethought to say, if we're going to re completely restore this, we need these structural elements to be restored as well. Paint scheme currently reflects the original paint scheme, not in color, because it was a black and white picture, but by the intensity of the paint on the house in that early picture, you can figure what areas were painted a lighter color, what areas were painted a darker color. So the choices of color were made based on that original paint scheme, not in terms of color itself, but in terms of the choice of contrasting colors. 2020, the Anderson House roof was replaced with wood shingles in 1994 or 1996, about that time. The, there were several layers of composition shingles. Those were removed and a new wood shingle roof was placed on. Now the Victorians were in the habit of painting their wood shingle roofs with a preservative paint that gave them added protection and extended their lifespan. That was not done with a 1994 wood shingle roof. So by 2020, it had become as brittle as potato chips. And any effort to scale the roof was impossible because you created any more damage putting the slightest pressure on the wood shingles. It became obvious that the only answer was replacement. Some of us, the purists among us, said, well, we need to put on a wood shingle roof. Others, who had a more sober viewpoint, said, I don't want to be faced with another roof replacement in 20 years. Let's go with something that will last longer than that. So the decision was made to replace the deteriorated wood shingles with a Class A roof with a lifespan of possibly 30 or more years. And the uh, fire chief had a uh, Fire about chief this. said, you know, we might have worked around it and, and uh, appealed to the historic preservation sir, uh, in Sacramento for a variance or at least support for a variance. But after the argument was made about, let's not deal with this again in 20 short years or thereabouts, that made it a moot point in that wood shingles are generally outlawed in the city of Monrovia. There might be a possible historical exception, but when the decision was made, no, let's go with something long lasting, then that became a moot point. So solicitations were made, a GoFundMe account was set up, lots of publicity went out about the need to replace the roof. The responses were very gratifying. We had several people who made very substantial contributions and arranged for contributions of in-kind that made the process much, much easier. Uh, the single choice, initially it was going to be a plain shingle and then one of our generous donors said, well, why don't you consider this as a roofing material? I used it on my personal residence because I wanted to create a Victorian impression. We looked at the material, it's called Carriage House. We thought, yes, this absolutely gives it a period appearance. So that material was selected. The roofing crew came, they carefully removed the old wood shingles, sheathed the roofing structure itself in plywood, and then put down roofing paper and the new barn, or the new barn red, well, basically the barn red, carriage house shingles that enhance the appearance of the house tremendously. The front facing facade was repainted so that from the street, the house presents a very pleasing appearance. And a local handyman dealt with the issue of the front porch in terms of straightening out some edges that had drooped over time. Speaking of drooping over time, and so it now presents a very fresh, very well cared for appearance. And it's very gratifying to drive by and see it as it appears now, looking very, very much as it did in 1886. You just need to visualize 
John and Lizzie and George and his other older and Lewis standing out in front to complete the picture. The other thing that would complete the picture, although I'm not advocating it, would be the construction of the original privy in the backyard. But there are pictures of it, and that's enough. Yard renovation is in the process. Plastering, interior plastering is in process. The plaster in the kitchen was particularly vulnerable. It looked as though it might fall with the next strong earthquake, so it was taken down. And now we're in the process of securing the services of a plasterer familiar with that plastering process to redo the kitchen ceiling as well as touching up a couple of the rooms that need attention. So is it safe to say that the maintenance of the Anderson House, which is the one of the cores core, of the core historical values, society, right. is an ongoing? It's ongoing, mm -hmm. which means donations gratefully received. To sum up, the Historical Society has two main focuses, one being the legacy project and the ongoing addition of things to the legacy project as they are made available. Sandy, I've alluded to the fact that yes, I've got more stuff, but when Sandy was you know, in the field of battle dealing with the collections, I thought, this is, not a, this is not a bit of information I need to drop in her lap right now. There is more to be added, not a huge amount, but some other interesting items that would be great to be part of the collection. Good. And then the other part of it, of course, is the ongoing maintenance of the Anderson House, the plastering, the landscaping, and getting docents secured and in place and making sure it can be open once again on a regular basis for school children as well as, in, as made available on a, on a request basis by other interested individuals or groups of individuals. So the Historical Society is back uh, vibrant and active and has an active membership. It does. Uh, and continues to, as th this series of videos shows, uh, we continue to produce things of interest things from of of interest. a historical nature right. coming from your brain uh, and others. And others. So it's still fulfilling a very important purpose in making the Anderson House available to anyone wanting to know what life was like in Monrovia a hundred plus years ago. There are some individual homes in Monrovia that have an aspect of it, but not to the degree that the Anderson House has. It's an immersion experience that cannot be replicated. So that's it's great value, it's, it's, it was its value as originally envisioned. Let's provide an immersion experience where you can step back in time and say, so this was what it was like. 